was going to mention something about Pope Paul VI. Pope St. Paul VI, who was, uh, uh, the, became the Holy Father after John XXIII. John XXIII had opened the Second Vatican Council because of the need to, to uh, discern how we as church are called to proclaim the gospel in the modern age. The previous council, Vatican I, was in 1870. That's where papal infallibility was uh, proclaimed, actually by this pope, Pope Pius IX. And, uh, and also uh, where we recognize around that same time the need to uh, proclaim the, the work of social justice in, in an industrializing age, you know, the Industrial Revolution, that started to leave the poor behind and people were working in squalor and, and so there were uh, a lot of other social justice issues that tie back to that time. But the Second Vatican Council, of course, was calling us to proclaim the gospel in the modern world. And at the time, Cardinal Giovanni Battisti Montini, who was to become Paul VI, he was one of the cardinals at the council and an advisor to Pope John XXIII. And, and when they first started the council, they started to use some of the language from the previous uh, councils where uh, it was condemnatory. Anybody who believes this, be, the, be they condemned. If they believe this, you know, an, is, an issue in, that goes against our church teaching, be they condemned. That was a style. And uh, Paul VI saw the, the, those first drafts that were coming from the Curia that they were that same style. He said, we can't speak that way to the modern age and addressed it to uh, Pope John XXIII and uh, asked, you know, we, we have to change a shift. And the Pope says, well, you know, these are the curia. Of course, I'd ask them to formulate these first things, these first documents to get things started. And he says, but if you raise it from the floor and have bishops also, because all the bishops of the world were gathered at the Vatican to, to uh, enact this council, and, and ask for a redrafting, uh, then of course I'll allow it. And so that's what he did. Uh, Giovanni Battisti Montini, the cardinal of, of uh, Milan, stood up and raised this, uh, this cry and, and all the bishops <laughs> gathered around him. And when you read the poetry of the Second Vatican Council documents, I am so inspired by them as to what it means to be Catholic. And uh, they're often very much misinterpreted, unfortunately, but, but it, it is great spiritual reading to understand who we are as church and how we're called to, to proclaim the true faith. And he was the one who inaugurated those things, those transitions, but really it's, most of it was uh, a new way of proclaiming eternal truths. The eternal truths never change. And he has great wisdom in that. And so as we're coming now to the uh, final uh, part of the Easter season, we hear uh, this uh, account of Jesus, one of his last appearances to Simon Peter. Again, an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus, body and soul. I mean, here they're having breakfast together. They uh, uh, had just, you know, shared this meal, and then Peter and Jesus have this time alone. And of course, and you may already be aware of this, but that Jesus would ask Peter three times, do you love me, seems redundant and uh, kind of annoying to Peter. But Jesus is also giving him three t opportunities to, to profess his commitment to the Lord because of the three times that he had denied him. In fact, the detail that the evangelist puts in there is that this is taking place around a charcoal fire where they cook the fish, and the only other time a charcoal fire is referred to is when Peter's standing in the court of the high priest warming himself, and Jesus is being tried, and people ask him, three different people ask him, aren't you one of his companions? No, no, I, I don't even know him. So, so here, Jesus is giving this, this man who had let him down at his darkest hour is giving him a chance to reclaim and profess his faith. Because at the Last Supper, Jesus said, I will die for you. And he didn't have the capacity. He had the desire to do that, to, to commit himself completely, but he didn't have the capacity to do that. And really, even in this scene, he still will be lacking that until 10 days later at Pentecost when the 
the Holy Spirit will empower him. And then we are going to see such courage on the part of Peter that's going to play out for the rest of his life. Fearless. Fearless because of his resolve and and his empowerment by the Holy Spirit. Well, I think it's also important to note, this is the leader of the church. This is the first pope. This is the one, uh, you know, uh, that many now have succeeded him, like the saint we celebrate today, Paul VI. The great leader failed like any other human being and was given another chance. And Jesus gave him every opportunity to do the right thing. In fact, one of my favorite scenes uh, from the Gospel of Luke is uh, where that scene happens. Uh, Jesus, uh, in St. Luke's Gospel, is very unique in that uh, Peter, at, when he denies Jesus three times and the, and the rooster crows, it, it, St. Luke describes how Jesus looked at Peter at that moment. Oh, man, I would not want to be there and receive that look, you know, because Peter probably interpreted as, I, you have let me down. Uh, you failed me. But that's not what Jesus was communicating. He was communicating what he said before at the Last Supper. Peter, you are going to deny me three times, but I know that in the end, you will unite, you will strengthen your brothers. Saying, the look meant, I know you failed me now, but you have it in you to do the right thing. And he did. Eventually he did. And we all do too. You know, every once in a while I kind of hit myself, oh John, you idiot, you know better. (laughs) You know, when I when I let down the Lord or fail to follow through or sin or something, whatever, you know, <clears throat> you know, make any kind of mistake. But I also know the Lord is going to give me another chance. His grace will be enough for me, for all of us. And, and that's so important for us to remember. And if it's true for the first leader of the church, then it's true for all of us. So, so I, I find great solace in this account and, and also in the courage that Peter shows and, and pray to have that kind of courage. And as we approach this, this uh, great feast of Pentecost, I encourage you, as I will do for myself, and this is going to be the theme of uh, Sunday Pentecost homily, is pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Pray for the gifts of the Holy Spirit to empower you to live authentically the gospel that Jesus has placed in our hearts. And we see that great example, of course, in Pope Paul the the sixth, uh, who's really a hero of mine, mainly, you know, administrators don't get much credit, but he was a gifted administrator totally at the service of the church. His whole career was in administration, if you will. But it is, when you see it as absolutely in service of the church, it's not for yourself. And just, I'll leave you with this last line. Because anybody who's in role of leadership in a family you know, or, or among uh, f- friends or associates or at workplace, if you really understand leadership, it's about service. It's always about service. And, and that uh, someday you're going to, somebody else is going to fasten a belt and take you where you don't want to go. You know, leadership means you just got to follow what the need is. It may not be what you personally want to do, but it's what's right for the whole organization or in this case for our church god bless those great leaders and our holy our holy father now pope francis in their important ministry